Recording. Hey, um, bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, welcome to our February post-media talk. Um, I will make just a couple of comments here, uh, a couple of housekeeping keeping comments, mainly that you should all be on mute and uh, please remain that way so we don't have background noise interference. Um, and if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. And so um, our pleasure today is to have Dana Barron, who almost all of you know as not only Dana, and but also the president of the Alliance of Les Champlain uh, region. And uh, my understanding from him is that a decade or so ago, he decided that he wanted to get more in touch with his Quebecois background. Um, and in addition to going on the search, which he's going to talk about today, uh, he got a, it got him into seriously studying French through the Alliance and other people. And he is, he is going to give his talk in English today, although he was toying with the idea of giving it in French. And his French has, from where it was when he got back into it, has gone to the point where it's fully functional to do so, which is very much to his credit. Um, so without further ado, I will let, um, I will let Dana take over and uh, talk to us about trying to find his ancestors. Well, good, good morning. I guess it's good noon, everyone. Um, it's actually, uh, what, as you'll find out as we go through this, um, it wasn't really that I was trying to find my ancestors. It was more that I kind of stumbled over my ancestors and uh, learned a whole lot of really interesting things along the way. Um, it was it was really serendipitous more than anything else. Um, but yes, this is uh, the as you'll you know as we will see as we go through this. Th this was one of the reasons I took up learning French. And um, yes, and as, as uh, Eric pointed out, it's hard to keep it up, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I can I can get by in French at this point. So um, I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to, with some nice photos that I can show you as we go through this. And so you should now see a nice fleur de lis. Um, so in the summer of 1998, uh, almost by accident, my wife and I started a voyage of discovery that took us really to entirely unexpected places. It was a voyage of place, but also a voyage of time. And this is the story of the doors, doors that opened unexpectedly and doors that connect the past to the future. So let's see where we go. Uh, oops, I got to do this first. There we go. So. Our, our voyage began with this document. This is a list of the names, the places, and the dates of marriages of my ancestors going back 11 generations. My aunt, my father's oldest sister, had it created by the American Canadian Genealogy Society of New Hampshire. And she shared it with my father who shared it with me. It shows that we had ancestors in New France since the 17th century. You can see that my father, George Barron, crossed out his sister's information in the upper left there and entered his own. He and my mother were married in Claremont, New Hampshire in uh, 1948. So the document itself was was in, was really interesting, but didn't really know what to do with it other than, you know, to put it away as a curiosity. Uh, but then one, one day in about 1998, uh, one door closed and another opened. Um, in that summer of 1998, my wife and I had plans to visit my sister in Virginia. I forget the details now, but for some reason, those plans fell through. So one door closed. We had already taken time off from work, so we had the time to do something else, but we really didn't know what. It was my wife who had the brilliant idea. Maybe we could take the list of my ancestors and visit all the places of their marriages. So another door opened. We had no idea what we would find beyond that door. I'd already been to Claremont, New Hampshire many times, so we didn't think it necessary to go there. And the next closest destination, both in time and in distance, was saint Clotilde de Orton, where my great-grandparents were married in 1898. So we packed up everything we needed for a week of camping and headed out. 
what you see is a map of uh, the uh, section of the province of Quebec. And the red crosses show the villages where my ancestors were married. So the very the, the lowest one, the, the one further south, is St. Clotilde near to Drummondville. And that's the first place we went. So if you travel in rural Quebec, you probably, most of you have probably done so, uh, you'll find that it's a province of small villages and that each village has its own church. From a long way off, you can see the steeples reaching skyward. Our trip took us from one village to another in search of the churches of my ancestors. And this was the first stop, St. Clotilde. My great-grandparents, Cléophas Baron and Elmire Provencher, were married here in 1898. This is a typical. This is typical of the churches we found across Vermont. The uh, the pattern in the bricks, the, um, the the tall steeple in the middle, the the, the, the smaller steeples on the sides. The uh, the 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 front um, is is very similar to a lot of the churches that we saw on our journey. In fact, you'll see another one looks a lot like it in the next slide. <clears throat> So next, we found our way to Saint, Saint Monique Nicolet, where my great great grandparents, Jeremy Baron Baron and Josephine Boudreau, married in 1863. So it's a little hard to see it this this one because of the trees, but this, you notice how similar the front is uh, of this church is to the other: the the tall steeple in the middle, the two smaller ones, the the door, the two door, the three doors in the front, um, very similar kind of a style. But Next one's a little different. In Nicolet, on the banks of the St. Lawrence River, across from Trois Rivières, two generations of my ancestors were married. In 1827, Louis Baron married Jeanne Provencher, and in 1786, Jacques Baron married Félicite Ratier. The cathedral in Nicolet is not at all typical. It's obviously built much more recently. In fact, what we found as we asked around is that almost every church in which my ancestors were married was destroyed just a few years later. I don't know why, what's up with that. Um, but each of the churches was built, uh, rebuilt in the same place, not always in the same style as we can see here. But So you can see also as on, on the, the excerpt from the document, my father not only crossed out his sister's information and put in his own, he also kept track of the generations as we go. So great grandparents, great, 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 and so on. Um, kind of, you know, he was having fun with it, I guess. A little further along the St. Lawrence, we found Saint-Croix, lot bidnière where, where another Jacques Baron married Marie-Francoise Oude in 1747. The doors to this beautiful church were open, so we took a look inside. And this is what we found. So when you open the doors to these, to one of these churches, even in the smallest villages, you find that they're beautifully decorated in gold and heavily polished wood. This isn't the only church that we went into on this on this trip. We've also been to the to the um, eastern townships a few times and visited some of the churches there. And almost every one you go into is decorated uh, to this level of of you know grandeur. In, even in the tiniest little villages. A little further along, we arrived at Saint Antoine Tilly, where yet another Jacques Baron married and married Anne Grenin in 1721. But at this point, ran, we ran into a mystery. It was a mystery that kind of posed a problem for us. Uh, the document that we had indicated that the last marriage on the list took place at Saint Francois. I period O period dash PQ, as you can see circled in the red there. So if you you know remember that this was an era way before Google Maps. So we were kind of you know stumped. What does I period O period mean? Um, we asked that a lot of, that question a lot to a lot of people at several different campgrounds and um, didn't seem to be having any luck. Nobody seemed to be able to give us an answer. And we were kind of starting to think that maybe the door, that door was going to stay closed. We weren't going to be able to find that last church. But then somebody finally hazarded a, a guess. Maybe I period, O period meant Ile d'Orléans. And so with that door slightly ajar, we set off. 
And indeed, on Ile d'Orléans, we found this beautiful church where Jacques, Jacques Berlon and Catherine Mesny were married in 1698. So we had succeeded in finding and visiting all the churches where my paternal ancestors were married. And at this point, we thought we had reached the end of our voyage of discovery. In fact, it had only just begun. After our visit to Saint-Francois, we decided to explore Ile d'Orléans. If you happen to be in the area around Quebec City, I highly recommend you take some time to explore this beautiful island in the St. Lawrence. Only one bridge connects the island to the mainland, and that wasn't built until the 1960s. As a result, the island is relatively undeveloped and retains a, a rural character. It also harbors a strong ag agricultural and artisanal com community. It reminds me in many ways of the Champlain Islands. Ile d'Orléans has a reputation as the cradle of Quebecois heritage going back to the arrival of the French. What made this is per, per, that, that heritage particularly strong is the fact that it wasn't connected to the mainland until the 1960s. So at the end of the day of exploration, we found a campground at the eastern tip of the island. This is a view from that campground. And with a view like this, Yes, you could almost believe that we were still in 1698. And the next day, we're ready to leave for home, but then we stumbled across something else that was kind of interesting. We found a genealogy library and boutique. And given the nature of our journey, we decided to check it out. It was early in the morning, and they'd just opened, so there was no one else there. And at first, the owner didn't pay us much attention. But after I showed him my document, he got really interested and started hunter, hunting around his, his shop and library. And as he hunted, the doors to my ancestors' past opened one after another, and the pile of interesting documents grew. And here are some of the things he found. They're difficult to read, but in the document on the left, the red arrow points to the original marriage record for Jacques Berlin and Catherine Mesny from 1698. And the red arrow in the document on the right points to the baptismal record for their son, baptized in 1701. He also found a short biography of Jacques, Jacques Berlin, my first ancestor with the barren name in the New World. This was the work of Michel Langlois, who wrote a biographical dictionary of the Quebecois ancestors, 1608 to 1700. From this, I learned a lot about Jacques Berlon. He and Catherine Mesny had 18 children. After Catherine passed away and he remarried in 1734, he came to Quebec as a soldier, aged 22 years, and spent some time in the hospital in Quebec. He took a, up a career as a miller and eventually moved off the island to Saint Antoine Tilly, and he died in 1749. And this is a map of the island. The red circle in the upper right <coughs> shows the land owned by Etienne Mesny, father-in-law of Jacques Baron. A little later, a sort of side door opened when I learned that perhaps the land circled in blue was owned by an ancestor from my mother's side, Esprit Carboneau. My mother's maiden name was also Carboneau with the same spelling. There are many Charbonneau, spelled with an H, but the Carboneau name is rare. I tried, but wasn't able to establish a clear link. But if my mother's side descends from Esprit Carboneau, that would mean that over 300 years ago, the ancestors of my father and those of my mother lived less than two miles apart. And again, we were thinking our journey had reached it, its end, but then another door opened. The shop owner pulled out this document showing the land records of for the property owned by Etienne Mesny on the island, going back all the way back to 17, 1671. And the last big door that opened was this. He gave us the address of the property. So I said, you mean I can actually go to the prop? property owned by my ancestors in the 17th century? And he said, well, sure. So we set out to find 173 Chemin Royal. And here it is. But the idea of knocking at the door of a stranger made me more than a little nervous, especially given the language barrier. 
It turned out not to be a problem, though, because there was a little boutique at the address and they were open for business. And so, a bit timidly, we walked in and after a few minutes, I managed to get up the courage to talk to the owner. Turned out to be a very friendly, and once he understood the reason for our visit, he was really interested. He gave us a tour of the property and even gave us a few of the relics that he had found there. He then invited us to return any time, which I have done many times with my various members of my family since then. My fam Each of the family members that went were impressed that we could actually walk on the land that our ancestors owned 300 years ago. So this was the end of the original voyage of discovery, but in many ways, it was just another beginning. So our, our journey had taken, to, taken us to some really unexpected places, but I really wanted to know more. Could I find more information about Jacques Baron's background? From the material we gathered in Ile d'Orléans, I knew something about his parents. Isaac Baron and uh, Jean Martineau lived in Cannes in Normandy in the 17th century. Could I pick up the trail in Normandy? But there was a bit of a language barrier. If I wanted to do more research, I would need to speak French. And that's one of the reasons I decided to embark on another voyage, a voyage to learn French. And about 10 years later, after studying French for a while, my wife and I embarked on a voyage to Normandy. I had the address of the Diocese of Bayou, so I went there. I knew very well that when I knocked at that door, it would be opened in French. So I worked up the courage and, and I knocked and indeed a friendly woman opened speaking French. I wasn't able to learn much about that, about Isaac Barron or Jean Martineau, but it wasn't due to the language barrier. Instead, I learned that the archives that would have contained the correct records had burned a few years before. Actually, it was a little more complicated than that. When we went to the diocese in Bayou, um, they sent us to the church in Caen. And the church in Caen, there's actually two. One sent us to the other, um, each time speaking French. And at the second church, when I you know, asked, was asking about uh, archives for marriages and baptismal records and so on, they said, oh, in the early part of the 20th century, those records were all taken over by the, the government, and they, they no longer belonged to the church. And so they sent me to another part, Bayou. Um, another, uh, I was going back and forth across Normandy. It was 40 miles at a time. Uh, and they sent me back to Bayou, where there was a um, big uh, archive of, of, of uh, genealogy records from churches and, and so on. And what I found there was that I was looking for the record that would describe, that would tell me um, who Isaac Barron's parents were so I could go back one more generation. So that would have been, uh, would, would have required that I would needed, that I was looking somewhere around 1632 or 1634. Um, and what I learned was that the records um, for that period, like a four year period, all burned in a fire um, about, 10 years ago, or 10 years before I was there. So that wasn't happened. <clears throat> but anyway, my voyage to learn French continues, lot, largely right now with Alliance Francaise. And um, now, 12 generations later, there is another Isaac Barron, my grandson, who connects the past to the future. And that's the, uh, the end of my talk. I have Plenty of time to answer questions. Are there? I can't see the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, there's nobody in it right now. I'm mean, got nothing in it right now. But um, um, actually, actually, I have a question. Okay. Uh, and that is that if you if you go across into across the border into Montérégie mm -hmm. um, and uh, go through the villages, um, which we have started doing uh, to our pleasure, um, and um, the, the churches there, you know, each one has its has its great big church. The churches in this area seem to be at least immediately north seem to be very plain on the outside, almost almost whitewashed. Mm -hmm. Whereas the one you showed. 
seem to have more um, exposed stone mm -hmm. and um, of of that of that nature. Is that just a, a regional difference within Quebec, or is it uh, um, local? You know, local styles. Is it building material? Do, do, you, mm -hmm. do you have any any thoughts on that? That's a that's a good question. I I don't I don't wouldn't uh, claim to be any kind of an expert on an, in answering that question, but um, I I know the you know of what you speak. You know, if you go up across the border and you're heading up to Montreal, those the you're not not anymore because they're almost done with the new thirty five. But um, the uh, the old one thirty three that took you through all the small villages, uh, some of them were very um, elaborate on the outside, and some of them were not. Um, some of them were similar to the ones that I saw here, and a lot of them were not. Um, I, I'm not sure if it has to do maybe with the size of the village. Um, you know, the larger villages had a little bit more uh, people in the pews that would would be able to pay to, um, you know, to make make it a little more elaborate. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, though, that I'm finding um, when you go go across the border now, um, uh, you imagine you've heard the history of uh, uh, la, la revolution, la, la revolution tranquille, the silent revolution. Uh, in Quebec that um, pulled people away from the churches. And a lot of the churches now are, are actually for sale. Um, the, uh, you know, as they consolidate parishes into, um, you know, large, lar you know, pull people together. A lot of the churches are, are for sale. I know the one in Pike river is one that comes to mind. It's right, right across the border anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There, okay, the questions are starting to accumulate. Can you see this at all, Dana? Or um... uh, I'll stop sharing and then I'll be able to see it. Okay, okay, okay. There they are. The... Okay. Um, so, um, Kim wants to know what advice would you give someone who wanted to start a similar search? I'd start with the Canadian uh, Genealogy Society. In uh, in Vermont, there's one. Um, I think that they're still in the in the Champlain Mill. Um, the uh, they they're a good place to start. They they have access to the records um, that that uh, do what you would need. If you if you uh, it's it's actually a pretty simple process. The there's there's like books of of the uh, the genealogy records, and so it. Um, if you if you start with uh, with you know like your grandparents and then learn what their name what their parents names are you look that them up in the book and that'll tell you the names of the parents the next one back um it, and um it, it's it actually because the uh, the Quebecois were were very um good record keepers and uh, in ter in terms of marriages and baptismal and so on and so forth um it's it's just really easy to do um there's sometimes there's some uh, hiccup in the family that uh it'll throw you off a little bit um but um it was a little interesting i i, I pointed out that jacques baron uh, the first jacques baron was um uh remarried in 1734 i think something like that um it was a little confusing trying to sort that out when i when i first you know was was going through this but um but yeah, it's just generally pretty easy to do. Um, and then the next one's from Patsy. Um, do I know if any of my female ancestors came to Canada as filles de roi? Um, I don't know if everybody is familiar with the uh, filles de roi, uh, but those were basically um, mail order brides that the French um, king sent over to Quebec to uh, populate uh, his new, new France, La, La Nouvelle France. Um, as far as I know, no, no, none of the direct, uh, per, you know, none of those that are in that direct line that I showed. I was basically, as you could, as you figured out, I was showing the the, the male line, as you will, all the way back. Um, but as far as I know, none of the people, none, none of those women connected to that directly to that male line were fille de roi. But you know the way genealogy works is it spreads out and so i wouldn't be at all surprised if there's a few uh in, in there somewhere and let's see what's next um are your children interested in learning french so they can explore your slash their heritage my daughter my um uh, isaac's mother um took french in high school and she got pretty far on um, 
but at, at this point in time, nobody is is learning uh, French. My other daughter, my younger daughter, is a Maya archaeologist, and so she's actually very fluent in Spanish. Um, she actually learned Italian when she was in high school. She went and spent six months in Italy, um, but now she's she speaks Italian. As of right now, nobody seems all that interested in French, but um, Isaac Barron is Isaac Barron because my daughter... Uh, because of this connection with the with the Isaac Barron in Normandy, um, uh, um, interesting little piece of, of the puzzle there. Um, why Isaac? Isaac is not ex exactly a French name, um, certainly in the 17th century. Um, and um, I, I don't know if I can reshare my screen and show you um, one of the interesting things. Let me do that because I've got plenty of time here, I think. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and we're going to go back a few steps, uh, and I don't know if you can see it, but, um, whoops, right back. so uh, I'm going to read you what it says at the bottom of this note. Um, if you can, it says, um, notes, Baron, uh, this is in French, titre de noblesse employé, Comme sobriquet pour désigner une personne hautaine, uh, a high-ranking person, um, or uh, ou encore celui qui était en, au service de, dans un baron, or somebody who's in service of a baron, um, who uh, qui détenait des terres ar arpentantes à un baron, or somebody who works the, the land of a baron. The mot avait cependant un autre sens au Moyen Âge. Et pouvait désigner un homme, surtout considéré en tant que mar mari. Le patronome doit correspondre à ce second sens dans le de nombre. À, note, à noter enfin que Baron peut aussi être un patronome juif. So the Baron could also be a Jewish pat, um, last name. And if you put that together with Isaac, uh, that suggests that perhaps there's some uh, Jewish background there. Um, and uh, what's what's interesting? I haven't had a chance. I, I would I've, every time I sort of come across that, I think I should look up the w the status of the Jews in French in France in 1630s and see um, where that comes from and where it goes. Um, but anyway, I thought that was a an interesting little little tidbit. And now I got to unshare so I can uh, come back to you guys. But I got to find where to do that. Did that? I probably didn't share, did it? Oh, well, no, never mind. No, it didn't here. <laughs> okay, but anyway, that's... Uh, um, so, what? why did your dad take out his sister's biographical info and <laughs> replace it with his? <laughs> because that's my dad. Um, he, uh, you know, was... He, yeah. It's it's a, the same, the same lineage, obviously, but... Um, he uh, yeah he, he that's just my dad and <laughs> no one else to say. Um, are there accommodations other than camping on Ile d'Orléans? I'm sure there are. Um, it's uh, it's not very well developed. Um, it's uh, it, it it extends in the river um, long long you know lengthwise east to west and the bridge from the mainland to to the island is uh, in the e on the western end closest to the to Quebec. Um, and um, that end of the island, once they, once the bridge was, uh, was put in, that end of the island began to develop um, fairly quickly. Uh, and fairly soon, fairly early on, people understood that that's what was happening and put in some pretty strict um, zoning regulations or whatever to um, keep the island mostly rural. But the western end of the island is does have some development and i would imagine there would be some hotels there at the very least i mean the 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 city of quebec is not that far away um it's it's maybe a 10 mile drive out from from quebec uh, if that and uh so it's easy to get to from 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 the, the quebec um eric asks are you were you able to trace our, your female ancestors and their lineages or is this this is patrilineal and um I haven't really done a whole lot with it. I actually have a sister that's done more with it than me. And he's that she's done more on my mother's side. She's much more, much, maybe it's because I don't know gender or what, but she's much more interested in my, my, 
the 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 female side of the lineage, including my my mother's ancestors and my my grandmother um, on my mother's side was um, was a, a Kelly, and so my sister has actually gone to some villages in uh, Nova Scotia where some of the old Kelly ancestors uh, live. Um, and there was a was as well as Isaac among your ancestors. Yes, there was. You're right. So that's the good point, Kim. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. I mean, you know, you uh, the uh, 23 and Me thing. I've, I've done that before. And when you look at that, it doesn't say anything about any Jewish background. But you're right. There are a few. And I don't know if Moise is uh, is is a is it strictly Jewish or if there's uh, some French Canadian stuff going on there too, but yeah, you're right. I would like to to delve into my Jewish connection a little bit more. I haven't had a ch time chance to do that, but. Or it just may be, it may be just simply a biblical name. Mm -hmm. Could be. Uh, yeah. Moses, you know, and uh, Isaac are biblical names. So. Mm -hmm. The reason for it, not necessarily uh, a Jewish background. Right. right. Well, it could be true with Isaac as well, but, you know, the yeah. the connection there, you know, the what I was reading from is the, the, the biographical notes that I got on him suggesting that 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 Bar that uh, Baron was also uh, a, a Jewish um, last name in the in the in the Middle Ages. Um, so I don't know. Um, Mar Mary Weiss points out that Marie Weiss points out that there are in fact inns on the island. I'm sure there'd be bed and beds and breakfast. And I know that um, we stayed at a bed and breakfast. Uh, we, one of the times I went there with my ancestors, we actually rented out a, a whole house. Um, literally, literally, 22 of us went, and um, so there are things you can do. Um, and Kim asks, are the um, the the land owned by my ancestors is measured in our pont? And that's a that is a measure of area. I don't know how, how it translates to acres, but yeah, that's a an old old style measure uh, of land uh, land area. Any other questions? Yeah, or comments? Yeah, um, I, I would tell you, you know, the the, the by the eighteen um, eighteen what eighteen sixties eighteen seventies. When you're um, when Isaac Barron um, arrived there, um, uh, that that area was pretty well settled. By you know, that, that, that it was early on, but it was mm -hmm. already starting to get pretty well settled. And my memory um, from reading Champlain's comments is that he built the city of Quebec where it is because he wanted a defensible fort. Mm -hmm. but in fact, there's very little arable land right around Quebec City, mm -hmm. and that they started they started using the Ile d'Orléans fairly early on as a place for a place to grow crops, uh, mm -hmm. to keep cattle, etc. And so it was, yeah. And as yeah. And as you noted, it is still very much agricultural. It's you know, mm -hmm. it's good good arable land in a in an area where to the north it gets very hilly, very rocky, very quickly. Um, Kim asks a question about the the the, the land use on the island, um, the strips, the long strips of land, the way in which the the island was divided up. Um, the um, when you owned a piece of land on Ile d'Orléans, you owned from the the top of the hill, which runs the, like the spine of the island, in a narrow strip all the way down to the river, and and the reason for that is that the that each owner had a little bit of all of the different types of land that existed on the island. So in the in the up, the upper reaches, the higher level, the higher um, altitude um, is mostly forest. So you had access to wood uh, for fire, for for building, and so on and so forth. A little further down, it flattens out a little bit, and uh, that would be where you could um, raise crops or or uh, keep um, livestock of, of various kinds. Um, then a little bit further down still you're now on uh, you're you're on the you know uh, on the sort of on the the edge of the 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 uh, the cliffs that go down to the river um so that's that in that area is where houses were mostly built so you, you would see the 
uh, the road, uh, Chemin Royal, that makes the 35-mile uh, tour of the island, um, mostly is at that place where it's just, just before you get to the edge that goes down to the river. Uh, and then it does go right down to the river. So again, as an owner of the land, you have access to the river, which means you have access to fishing, you have access to, to uh, water transportation. Uh, you can go visit your neighbors, you can go over to Quebec and so on and so forth. Um, one of the times we visited, um, the people that owned that land um, actually took us on a little um, four wheel ATV right down to the river, which was really kind of fun. Um, uh, and uh, Cassidy would like to know, have you tried Ancestry.com? Um, I did play around with Ancestry.com at one point. Um, what I found repeatedly was, and that and others, uh, there's other, there are other genealogy search um, software available. But what I kept on finding was that um, I'd scratch the surface a little bit and I'd fall into the same river. And what I mean by that is that I, you know, I'd, I'd um, find a little bit of information about my one of my ancestors, which would drop me right into the same um, trail that I've already just described. And uh, so over and over again, I'd, you know, find, oh, there's something about a baron. And then it's like, oh, that's, that was somehow related to this baron. Oh, that's, you know, and then I'm in that same river of time. It was, um, it, it, it seems to be a pretty well beaten path. So Anyway, yeah, it was uh, it 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 was a uh, an amazing trip. As I said, you know, from the beginning, it was it was all serendipitous. And each time we thought we were done with this, you know, with this little adventure, some new door would open, and we'd be, oh my gosh, this is pretty amazing. So, yeah. are you are are you going to pursue this further? Um, I pursued it a little bit uh, a while ago. Um. And then other interests sort of got in the way. There's this thing, I don't know, maybe you're familiar with it. That's called um, uh, Alliance Francaise or something like that. Kind yeah, of yeah, um, yeah. kind of takes up a lot of time um, and, uh, you know, a few other things going on. I might get back to it at some point, but for right now, I'm, um, you know, this is, uh, it's it's put away for now anyway, so. Yeah. Okay, there's one one new message. Let's yeah, see. yeah, one new message. Yeah. Yes. When um let's see. It sounds like people were very friendly and welcoming in Quebec. So what I find when I go to Quebec, I, um the um if you try to, for example, go to Montreal and try to speak French, you're not going to get very far. They're going to change over to English right away. Um if you try to speak uh um English in other parts of of Quebec, yeah, they're pretty friendly. If you speak the the little the tiniest little bit of French in in the in the province, you know, away from um, Montreal, they are incredibly friendly. They're incredibly helpful, especially around Quebec City. Um, the the uh, yeah, they they really like it when you make an effort. And Montreal is just the opposite. Um, but yeah, the, I I find I've always found the people in Quebec very helpful. Every church that we went to on this journey. Um, you know, whoever we ran into were very helpful. That one church that we went into, the, they said, oh, yeah, come on in. I'll, I'll open the door for you. And um, others, we we went to a few cemeteries to look for, um, for you know, anything that might have a barren name on it. We found a couple. Uh, but again, the, the people um, were, were really helpful um, doing that. So. Well. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Well, a bunch of thank yous. And yeah. And I think I thank you as well. Yeah, well, thank you all for coming. It was uh it was interesting uh, to to do this. Um yeah, as, as as Eric pointed out when I started, I I was trying to decide whether to do this in French or English. I I could have could have done it in French, but it's a lot more colloquial if I do it in English. I can I, I'm a little more facile in in English than I am in French, so all right, thanks for coming. Well, and thank you. Et bon merci. And thanks for everybody else for, for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Merci. Merci. Au revoir. Okay. All right.